In this lesson, we're looking specifically at the cell membrane. Lots of information about the cell membrane, but we are focused solely on the structure. So we've seen how the basic cell is structured and it may contain, you know, lots of different um, organelles. But this lesson is only looking at the structure of the cell membrane because it's highly specialized and it contains all the internal contents of the cell, but strategically allows for substances to move in and out. Right, so many scientists over the 20th century had a crack at determining how the cell membrane was actually arranged. Gorder and Grendel determined in 1925 that it was made of a type of fat molecule known as a phospholipid and decided to measure the number of phospholipids that were in a red blood cell. When they compared the total of the surface area of the red blood cell with the known size of phospholipid, they came up with that they counted uh, twice as many phospholipids than they thought they would get. So they deduced that there must be a double layer of phospholipids and drew it up as such. So Davson and Daniele came along and said, right, well, we've got a similar picture, right? This is the picture they came up with. But what they were actually looking at was two adjoining cells. So they saw that there were three layers. And we know now that they were looking at cell one and cell two, but they said, oh, well, we're looking at back-to-back bilayers here, so they must be, the cell membrane must look like a bit of a sandwich, right? Bread on top and filling in the middle. They proposed that on one side, so the bread, it was available to the outside and the inside of the cell, and therefore, you know, mingling and touching water molecules. So they're saying, oh, well, it can tolerate water molecules. It must be hydrophilic, right? Water loving. The inside part or the sandwich filling didn't want to be exposed to water, so they proposed it was hydrophobic, right? Water hating. They knew that there was phospholipids in there. They also knew that there were proteins, but their model had quite a few problems, um, not least of them being that they had no idea how certain molecules would actually move in and out with this sandwich, like kind of fortress of proteins around the outside. After playing around, this model was basically debunked and Singer and Nicholson came along and said in 1972, this is what we think it is. And this model showed that there's a bilayer of phospholipids, just as was predicted, but the proteins are actually embedded into the phospholipid bilayer. And they call this a fluid mosaic model, seeing as though it was fluid enough to change shape of the cell whilst being made up of components sitting side by side. Now, this is the model of the cell that we can confirm and hence use today. And this is what we're going to talk about. The cell membrane encloses the entire cell and it separates the internal uh, environment of the cell from the external environment. If you're a single celled organism, it's actually separating all your internal contents from the outside world. If you're a multicellular organism, you're separating the internal contents from, say, the extracellular fluid that's moving in between the cells. Now, it's made up of many components to make a bit of a fluid carpet. It's a cover for the cell, but it allows substances to come and go. It's selectively permeable and that means it allows things to come in and out but not others depending on the environment and the requirements of the cell at that time. So the fluid mosaic model can be depicted in so many different ways but you've got to keep remembering that this is a 3D structure. The bilayer of phospholipids that's there right and the proteins are embedded in there uh, as well as some other things like cholesterol. There's also carbohydrate molecules attached to say the outside of some of the protein molecules and this is a fluid situation right. The phospholipid bilayer is moving and changing and the cholesterol actually slows this down so it doesn't happen in excess and it all just kind of floats away. The external proteins can anchor things but allow for that movement and it's a mosaic so bits and pieces are sitting side by side that might be all different. The components we've talked about the phospholipids and this is a bilayer and they have hydrophilic heads right so this little bit here and the they point outwards but the hydrophilic little legs uh, arrange themselves inwards. So if you threw a bunch of phospholipids into a bucket of water, they would actually arrange themselves into this um, situation anyway. There are large proteins embedded into the uh, bilayer. Some of them span the entire length of it. Uh, they are transmembrane proteins. They are protein channels. There are also peripheral proteins that sit just on the outside of it or at the top or the bottom of it. And these can transport substance in. They can be used for cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Uh, they can be enzymes. They can be hormone signaling, all those kinds of things. Right, glycoproteins are proteins with carbohydrate chains attached and they actually work with cell-to-cell -cell recognition and adhesions for things to stick to that cell. And the cholesterol, again here, is embedded between the phospholipid bilayer to stabilize it. There's many, many depictions of this, but you've got to remember it's 3D, it's not 2D, it's a giant water balloon skin, it's not a doona. 
Now for a cell to function and perform the basic requirements for life, it must gain nutrients from around the cell and it must remove waste as well. It's selectively permeable, so it depends on what it needs and you know as to what's coming and going. And we'll look at the different ways that substances can come and go in the next lesson. So we've just focused on the structure of the membrane.